My name's Dean Francis and uh, I, uh, I direct and produce and shoot films. For many years I resisted film school. I, I, when I was younger I saw it as a, as a kind of evil um, institution that was going to just um, even out the entire artistic sensibilities of, uh, of the world and I tried to avoid it. But um, I guess I reached a point where I um, I both saw the advantages in terms of, of the recognition that, that the industry gives film school graduates over people who haven't gone to film school these days. Um, and also, the, the, you know, I, I was at a stage where I was craving uh, more collaborative relationships. Um, so I, I went to AFTAS, in, uh, I started there in 2004 and was there until 2006. And yeah, I uh, had an amazing time and really, uh, you know, it was a very worthwhile thing to do. And then, of course, subsequently ended up teaching at, film, at various film schools, um, you know. Uh, so I, I have developed m more of an appreciation for the, the value of a film school. I think you could say without m having, me having gone to AFTAS, I wouldn't have been in a position to get my first directing job uh, outside of film school, which, which was Road Train, um, I think because, for two reasons. One was that um, the, the film was funded by, um, as it was at the time, the Australian Film Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that, that they, um, uh, as a development agency, they saw their role to support uh, filmmakers who had already perhaps been supported by the government through AFTAs. Um, so there was that, that, that sort of political sense of, of, of that being advantageous uh, for me as a director. But I, I think moreover, uh, the films that I was able to make at film school uh, were what um, drew the producer of the film t to me as, the, as his pick for director of the project. Yeah, I'd made short films pretty consistently since I finished high school and I didn't really know anything about how films were made. I kind of threw myself into the process. Um, you know, this was obviously some years ago when uh, digital video was, was, was kind of a relatively recent phenomenon and um, it meant that the, the technology um, to, to make high quality stuff was becoming more accessible. But, you know, I was always really clear on the difference between film and video and, and, and I, um, my, my approach was like to go and, and kind of buy like a cheap Super 8 camera and, and um, basically just sort of pitch my idea to anyone who'd listen. You know, I literally would be going up to actors in cinemas and things like this and it worked, you know, and, and persuaded them to kind of jump on board this thing. And, and kind of really my only experience um, in filmmaking was, um, you know, I, I, I'd been an actor as a child, so I, I'd sort of seen the way shooting schedules worked and, and, you know, the way productions are kind of managed. And I guess I tried to sort of, you know, replicate that um, within the limited means. Um, and yeah, so I made um, about four short films, I think. Um, uh, and then, you know, as my ambition uh, increased, I, the films got longer and we, it culminated in making a, an internet sitcom, kind of, um, unfortunately, before anyone could really watch video on their computer because they still had dial-up modems. So, so it was a bit ahead of its time, you might say, and maybe not so well-timed, but, but that then developed into this, um, insane improvised uh, mockumentary feature film called Crazy Richard um, which was was intended it was it was sort of never it was intended as a 15 minute short but it kind of grew and grew and grew and then it swelled out and it became this 64 minute thing and you know um, it, it was the experience of taking that round the world to film festivals um, and securing distribution um, for that, that really uh, sort of solidified the path that I was on and, and, and made me even more um, passionate about moving into the features industry um, and, and then, of course, going to film school. I think the structure of a professional film set um, is something that you can experience in film school much more readily than you perhaps can if you're putting stuff together yourself. Um, I mean, you know, for example, AFTAS was incredibly well resourced when I was there, so you would always have a professional first assistant, you know, you'd have um, professional grips and gaffers and, and these things, and, and everyone is, is really working in a very industrial way um, in the way that any film and TV show is, is, is made. So um, I, I think that's quite a different experience to, well, what I was, which was a kid with a Super 8 camera. 
um, you know, sort of making it up as I kind of went along. And, you know, you, you learn as well about the political pressure of filmmaking, um, all of the kind of negotiation and sort of deal making and compromising that has to go into literally getting your film financed. I mean, it sounds weird that you'd have to get, try and like fight to get your film financed um, at, at film school, but that was very much the case when I was there. AFTERS was going through um, a kind of structural change in the way that it allocated its um, production budgets. And so directors were pitted against DOPs, for example, in terms of ha like having to pitch to even make a film. Um, and, you know, it was sort of this, this thing of how far you can sort of, you know, push the envelope and stretch the resource package. And, and then, you know, you have things like daily uh, progress reports and, um, you know, the, the, the issues to do with um, overtime and, and finishing on schedule and all these things are, are very incredibly important, obviously. Um, in the professional industry because, you know, films live or die by the director's ability to bring a film in on schedule. Uh, you, you don't have that pressure so much when you're sort of out there doing it for yourself because, you know, the, the, it's, it's, it's only your credit card that's on the line, you know. Um, so yeah, there was that. And, and I think as well, the collaboration, I think, um, you know, I'd been someone in the past who had like sort of written, directed, produced, shot, edited, you know, everything myself, which certainly has its, its advantages. Um, but when you go to film school, I mean, of course, particularly um, AFTERS is, is um, somewhat unique in, in that it really is an ecosystem. So you've got your four DOPs, your four directors, your four uh, editors, etc. Um, and so you develop these lasting and very close collaborative relationships over the time that you're there. And, um, um, so yeah, that was a, that was a huge benefit, which of course again is is another function of, of what you 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 know experience when you're out there in the professional world as opposed to sort of out there by yourself. Road Train was was technically speaking my first feature film, I suppose, but again everyone has a different definition of a feature film. Um, Crazy Rich was a 64 minute film, arguably that was the first feature film. Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, it was certainly the first professional. Uh, it was my first professional directing job. Um, where I was hired as a director and obviously under a director's agreement and um, had the responsibility of delivering the film um, as director. Um, how did that get up? Um, well, that was the brainchild of a very ambitious trailblazer called Michael Robertson who produced the film. Um, and Michael uh, had a very strong interest in genre films. Uh, and he'd made a film called Blackwater, which had been really successful. It was a low budget crocodile horror film. Uh, and he was pitching this, he was putting this film together uh, called Road Train, which uh, he said in the, my first conversation with him was inspired by Steven Spielberg's first film, Duel. Uh, and um, he had obviously attracted the attention of Screen Australia, who had supported Blackwater, I believe. He had the, the same finances on board. He had the script. He, ha he had the South Australian Film Corporation. He had a lot of elements already in, but he needed a director to take to Screen Australia to get the funding over the line. So I came into the process fairly late at a time when the script had, had basically been finished. And, you know, it, there wasn't a lot of room for me to have input into the script and that was one of the challenges for me and again that was sort of made pretty clear to me up front. The film uh, you know came together remarkably quickly despite the fact that the finance all fell through um, right before we were about to shoot. Um, didn't take Michael very long to refinance the film uh, and then get us to the point of shoot but then the finance fell through uh, another time <laughs> during the shoot and again Michael you know God knows how managed to get get it all back on track and um, complete the film basically. I enjoyed the process looking back on it now very much uh, of making Road Train but uh, at the time I think it was very difficult um, because you know there is this immense pressure on any low budget film um, in that if you go over budget I mean I remember you know, one time Michael saying to me, you know, like we were really under the gun, he, and he's he'd be like, you know, look, you, you know, you, either way, you're going, you're on a plane to um, back to Sydney on on this day, and and you you either go back with a finished film or an unfinished film. <laughs> it's up to you, um, because that's what it was like. It was really tough. Um, there were there was just a litany of technical challenges uh, to do with the tr the tr actual truck, the road train itself. 
Um, you know, like it seemed like every time we, we moved the damn thing, it would break and it would have to go back to the, the workshop and it would delay us. And, you know, then we, we you know, just the usual things. We sh we're supposed to be shooting this film that's set in a heat wave in the desert and it's raining all the time and it's cloudy and misty. Uh, through to we've got these really ambitious stunts, which are car wreck stunts, which can be really dangerous that, I've, you know, um, as, as much as you plan them out, you know, oftentimes they don't go to plan. We have unpredictable um, uh, cast members sometimes who, who just sort of, you know, is that one thing on top of everything else that you just don't want is, is a sort of um, scenario of, uh, tension with with cast not not the main cast i should say um that was one of the great things about the film was that that the four uh leads and myself were, became very close and were very much like a family and we were all um away in the middle of the outback together for for many many weeks um and there was a very, a very close bond uh there but you know i mean you you've got you've got these terrible things called daily progress reports and and directors live or die by them and if and you know of course these are sent to the the producers to the financiers to the completion guarantor and that's a huge pressure is having a completion guarantor reading the dprs every day and you fastidiously you know check them um, well as this is a lesson i learned is that you should as a director check the dprs before they go out for any inaccuracies because it's it's very easy just through the numbers on the DPR um, for a picture to form of a film that's not on track and you know of course if that happens too frequently then you know the people get fired the DOP usually first and then the 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 AD and then then usually the director and um, you know even the producer whose film it is can get fired by the completion guarantor if the if the film isn't on track so so it's always about this thing of you've got to be continually moving forward and when things aren't working for whatever reason logistics or, or creatively or what have you uh, it's just about you know finding a way to to keep moving forward and just knock those scenes off shoot the call sheet um, all that kind of stuff and and then there's the the challenge of 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 taking something that's really low budget and trying to turn it into like something that looks really big and that was my primary objective with it was to was to really make sure all the money went on screen and we were able to create a sense of, of spectacle um you know which which carl robertson and myself he was the dop um you know did through the way we we choreographed the camera and um we really tried to to um really sort of push style as, as far as we could within the the budget so again you're balancing that that sort of passion that stylistic priority with the these terrible things that are unfolding around you constantly. Absolutely, we all have a perception that American films are, are much bigger, which is, is often the case, but there's also a huge sector of the American film industry where, you know, particularly in genre, where, you know, million dollar, half million dollar budgets are, are, are kind of not unusual. So um, if you're going to be, a, you know, a director who competes in that market, you've got to, I think it's really an important thing you've got to be able to bring to a project is a sense of, being able to increase the production values beyond the, the, the limitations of, uh, of the actual budget. You know, I, I would say that probably 90% of a director's work happens before you set foot on set. And I think if, if, you, if you're, you're dealing with a clash of, of vision on set, then it probably means that something, you've, you know, you, something you haven't done properly in pre-production. Um, you know, obviously on the set, we're spending a lot of money every hour um, that we're there. And so there's not really that time to, to um, entertain any conflict. Obviously collaboration and discussion and, and, and um, that's, that tension, that back and forth is always very productive. But of course, um, everyone's work is in service of the director's vision. And you know the director's vision has to be the same vision, that, 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 which is also their vision. Uh, you've, you've all got to be on the same team. In terms of what am I like on set, I don't know. I mean, um, I try to remain calm. I think that that's a really important thing. Um, I think that as director, you really set the tone for the whole set. And, and I think that you need to be really conscious of your um, 
uh, disposition and th your energy on set, and you can use that um, to, you know, subtly affect the, the, the disposition of everybody else on the set, you know. Um, there are times when you might need to go into a like sort of furrowed brow concerned, I'm a bit upset mode, um, you know, so that people, you know, s just work that little bit harder to see what, what's troubling you or what have you and try and accommodate. Or there are times when you need to be like, you know, just a strong, fun, happy dude who's like, you know, leading everyone on this like adventure. Um, what you don't want to do too much of is like lose your cool, I think. Um, I try to have maybe one, maybe two instances on each film where I just lose my shit at something or somebody. Um, and again, that that's only got power if you're known as someone who doesn't continuously lose your shit. Because if you're doing that all the time and then you just lose your shit, it's like, oh yeah, he's just he's just going off his nut again. It's so boring. Um, but then again, if you've been perceived as this really nice dude who is friends with everyone and you really do need to kind of, you know, like really put your foot down, then if you've been nice for the last 25 days and suddenly, you know, something, you know, then I think it has input. Not that I'm saying that you should, you should, you know, ever intimidate people on the set because that's, that goes against the collaborative nature of, of what a film set is. I mean, the most important thing I think on any film set is, is trust and, and unity and um, a sense of, of being kind of in it together. I mean, it's, people describe it much like a, like being in a war zone. I've never been in a war zone, um, but I've certainly seen a lot of war movies and, um, you know, <laughs> it sounds to me like a, like a good, uh, analogy you know because you are there as a, as a team you've got all these tools all these weapons and you're fighting this common enemy there's probably two common enemies one is mediocrity and one is time you know budget. well budget yeah that's that's right exactly but time is the is the is really the, the um the big one i think if a scene is not working while you're filming it, you know, you've really got to go back to your priorities for the scene that you had uh, in the pre-production or development phase. You know, and, and these sorts of questions that you will ask of any scene before you go to direct it is, is, is what is so fundamentally important about the scene? What is the, the essence of the scene? What is, what's the change that happens in this scene? Why is it so necessary that this is in the film? You know? And th that often works on the level of the text of, of what literally is observably happening in the scene. But it, it, you know, invariably uh, there's another layer which is the subtext. Very often when a scene's not working, it's the, the, the text and the subtext aren't, um, aren't connecting. Uh, the, the, it's, often, it's often not to do with what's observably occurring. It's that that other layer that you need to subtly communicate to the viewer is not functioning properly. Uh, so by going back to that question of what is really, really going on here under the surface, that can refocus you. Um, the most important thing I think practically to do when a scene is not working is to change things. You've just got to disrupt um, the process because um, tweaking around the edges, if it's fundamentally flawed, uh, often doesn't really, uh, it, it actually just drives things worse. So, so you know, things like, uh, you know, if, if a scene isn't working on a kind of performance level, you know, you might take the actors off of the set. You might say to the, to the first, I'm gonna, you know, I just want want to clear the set for a moment. I'm just gonna spend 15 minutes working with the actors on the scene. Uh, you might um, take the actors off the set. You might, uh, you know, just something. And, and then you might say, if it's not working with performance, you might improvise the scene. You know, you might improvise what happened right before the scene, you know, because very often it's that point of attack into the scene that isn't working. In other words, the audience doesn't come into the scene feeling like it's, it's just a moment in time that we are now privy to, which is, a, a, you know, a, a living, breathing, part of a living, breathing sequence of events that unfolds through the characters' lives. There's no point of attack into it. Um, you know, you might find that it's actually something more technical that is uh, driving the problems with the scene. So you might have to reassess your coverage plan, for example. Um, you might realize that you're going to need to build the scene in a series of cuts as opposed to containing it within one shot. I, I always like to contain things um, within one shot where possible, or at least that was the approach in Road Train. But very often you'd, you'd realize for whatever reason that it was just not possible. I mean, I remember one shot in Road Train, um, for instance, where I'd planned it as this 
like a single shot where the truck was going to come out of the mist and um, the camera would uh, would kind of crane up over it as it sort of turned this corner and went onto the highway and then um, it was going to stop on the highway and the camera was going to sort of de-elevate down and then track along on this enormous like you know 50 meter uh, track um, and it was all going to happen in one really long shot. And I swear to God, you know, like seven takes later, you know, and the producers there tearing his hair out going, Dean, what are you doing? You know, you've just got to realize that this is not going to work. And how are you going to cover the scene without, uh, you know, compromising um, the essence of what you need to convey to the viewer without interrupting the, the energy and the, um, the tone of the piece, um, and so you know, you you have to sort of always have this 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 sort of secondary coverage plan in mind, um, uh, w which will kick in in the event of of problems. I think you know, I would also say to directors, you know that that you know, if you're too fixated on your own planning, even though you should do a lot of planning, of course, then the danger is that you are less available to opportunity uh, and collaboration. And, and I think that's a very important thing about directing is, is being able to say yes to off creative offers that are made to you. That's not to say that you like agree with every single idea that, that anyone ever pitches to you, but um, at least you are conscious of, of people's collaborative input and, and, th and thankful for it, and you are continuously in a dialogue with uh, your collaborators about how to improve or build on uh, the vision. So if you go in with the plan, and, and, but you're also very prepared to depart from the plan, it's easier to actually depart from the plan if you're really well planned as well, uh, I should say. Um, then you know you will. You just really have to be open, and 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 you know that possibility, that thing that will solve it, will come to you. I think. Road Train was was successful. It sold in uh, more than fifty country territories, countries, um, and. Um, uh, you know, and 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 it it got a very big distribution deal uh, in America, uh, where it was uh, on DVD. It was it was had uh, premium shelf space in like five thousand blockbuster video stores. Um, it's one of the most illegally downloaded films in the world for a, a while there. Um, and uh, th theatrically in Australia, it had a, a limited theatrical run. Um, it, it received uh, a pretty strong critical reception uh, locally. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, that, that having a film that's theatrically released that you've directed certainly gives a director a le legitimacy um, and sort of, I think, is that it's sort of a bit of a threshold point where people then, you know, see you as an actual director or what have you. And, and certainly it opens up um, possibilities for other projects and, and uh, different things. But, um, you know, at the same time as that, I think that we have a tendency to, to sort of see our careers in terms of like, there'll be this like tipping point moment where like everything will change for me and my life will, you know, suddenly, you know, I'll, I'll be successful and I'll get all these job offers and nothing will ever be the same again. Uh, and I certainly think it's tempting to think of a first feature film in those terms. Um, but what I've learned over the years is that, you know, it's uh, building a career is, is about very small steps, you know, and um, yeah, Road Train was was it was a step, but it certainly um, it certainly hasn't uh, it certainly <laughs> certainly hasn't made me a wealthy man. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly a kind of honeymoon period when your film comes out, which probably lasts about three months, where you know you can get like lots and lots of different meetings, and and if you're in LA, everyone will probably tell you how amazing you are and how much they want to work with you, and um, you'll have you know you'll have great meetings. I mean, it's like the, it's like they say about LA, it's the only place in the world you can die of encouragement. Uh, basically, um, and that's true. Uh, unfortunately, then um, you know, the, you realize that um, you know Hollywood can be very um, you know sort of fly by night, and there's someone else coming in right behind you uh, to to do those meetings and um, be the next the next big thing, you know, <laughs> and, and that's the way it works. Um, you know, yeah, I've I've done a lot of those meetings in LA, but again, it's it's about relationships, and and um, you know, as it happens, some of the relationships that I've I've sort of had, you know, for a number of years since since Road Train, um, you know, th that, that stuff is coming out of them uh, even, um, you know, even now. Um, so like, again, it's, it's, it is a very much an incremental thing. I think you've got to really go over there and understand the way um, the LA industry kind of works. It's quite different to here in, in lots of ways, I think. Um, 
So yeah, I suppose I, th I think I think it was more about sort of going over there and, and gaining an understanding of, of how it happens over there. I think uh, in Los Angeles, um, there's much more of a sort of open acknowledgement of the of the need for profit uh, out of uh, the creative process. Um, you know, it is very much a, an industry that is driven by the need to turn a buck and, and make money, um, you know, which is pretty sensible <laughs> you know, when you think about it, really. Uh, whereas here, I think there's this sort of, it's almost, it's almost like, um, uh, you know, there's a sort of unspoken sense in which none of us would, uh, will ha have any money. None of us will ever have any money. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, we're we're here because we're these sort of like passionate, driven, creative people. We're in love with the story, and and this is such an important story to tell, and and all this sort of stuff. And I tell you, that stuff just doesn't wash um, in LA. <laughs> I can tell you, it's such an important story. Who cares? Is it going to make any money? Um, you know, so so that that's a difference. And and there's something quite um, sort of you know sensible and kind of refreshing about that that approach I think there's a sort of sense of gloom I think that hangs over the film business here in if you're not careful um, because you know films um, here I think really struggle because we're we're sub subsidized so heavily by the government out of out of necessity um, whereas in in LA there's much more that sense that this could I suppose what it really is is it's about I mean it's that sort of Hollywood cliche about sort of the dream of Hollywood it's like every single project every single person every single actor every single director might just be the next big thing you know and if you can just you know sort of keep something going for long enough and if you can just be enthusiastic enough at the right point you, this might be your meal ticket that's going to set you up for the rest of your life and I mean as we know these things happen um, everybody excuse me wants to um, produce the next um, paranormal activity or the next saw or what have you and you never know I mean this might just be the one there's that sort of blue sky kind of you know, really is this idea of sort of like think big and this could be amazing kind of thing, um, which which is, you know, inspiring. I mean, I must say I like um, Los Angeles for that reason. There's this real sense of like, just like this, this could be so exciting and you know, there's so much enthusiasm and positivity. But at the same time, it's it's very much, you know, it's, it's there's a sort of various different strata to the industry. And I think if you're going over there and you're not working and you're not part of that excitement, it's, it's very easy to become kind of jaded by, by that and, um, um, you know, sort of, like I say, uh, die from, from too much encouragement and, and not, not enough realism. <laughs> I think theatrical is incredibly difficult here. Um, it really is, um, uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's a terrible challenge. Uh, you know, it's, how do we make the feature film industry sustainable? in this country. Um, there's so many factors. I think that people's viewing habits are changing. I think m many more people are shifting online and I think that the film industry here and, and especially globally has been really slow to kind of keep up with what audiences are doing and the way people are consuming content. I think that's a huge issue. I think piracy um, come, springs out of that. I think piracy has been so damaging to our industry, but I would blame the industry for that um, because I think uh, it's not so much about the affordability of content. Uh, you know, in other words, I think people are willing to pay for content. I think what people can't get legally is the, is the convenience, is the ready access to an enormous vast catalogue of, of films. Um, and I, I still to this day cannot work out why like, you know, five or even ten years ago when we saw the decline of the recording industry because of Napster, the, the film industry didn't just get together all the heads of the studios and say, look, we've got to get our shit together and, and redefine the way films are distributed. Um, and if they had have done that, they could have avoided the catastrophe that we're facing right now, I think. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult one. Um, I mean, the problem is it's, it's such a systemic problem because the way that we finance and, and sell films today uh, is quite an outmoded um, thing in, in the in the sort of global internet era. You know, we carve up the rights to our films into all these different territories and we sell them off one at a time. Now the problem, you know, often is that one territory will put the film out, you know, on whatever media um, and then of course suddenly the whole world has got access to it, you know, via um, piracy. 
Um, now, I mean, you know, th there was that instance of a hundred bloody acres uh, coming out theatrically after it had come out in, on DVD in another territory, and that just totally, I think, wiped it out because this, the sort of fanboys who were going to watch that film are the sort of fanboys who are completely au fait with all, all the means of piracy, and they all would have seen it, um, you know, in their smelly little bedrooms um, before the theatrical release. Um, how do we get people excited about films like Little Deaths? I mean, Little Deaths is a, is a really good film, and when I saw it, I, I must say, I, um, I thought, yeah, this is a great commercial movie. Um, but how do you get people out there? I think we've got to look at um, these things a bit differently and really, tr you know, I mean, I'm very drawn to the idea that, that, that going to see a movie should be like an event, you know, it's, it's like going to, going to see the... The, um, the sporting event, it's like going to see, you know, there's got to be something that defines it from the experience of sitting and watching it on your four and a half meter screen, um, you know, on your, off your projector, uh, um, you know, at home. And I think the distributors can be a little bit more innovative with the way they um, try and get audiences out there. Um, I think there's this terrible perception about Australian films even still, which I don't think makes any sense. Um, it's just one of these cultural cringe things that we all have to contend with. I mean, there's a lot of different um, factors, I think. But, but I also think that, that the future is not necessarily completely in theatrical distribution. You know, I think filmmakers always see theatrical as like kind of the, the be all and end all. Um, when, you know, if you look at the, the revenue over the life of a film, you know, oftentimes platforms like VOD and, um, you know, even still sometimes Blu-ray, uh, you know, can, can work out for filmmakers if they are smart and strategic in the way that they um, put their films out. You know, producers more and more uh, are being more realistic about, you know, where they see their films sitting, you know, from, from the outset. Um, you know, conscious of the fact that, that very often uh, a film makes more money from the ancillary um, release than it does from the theatrical release. And indeed, the theatrical release ends up costing so much money because you've got prints and advertising and, and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, many filmmakers have found this, that, that it's, it's hard to even recruit P&A. So you're, you're then sort of coming at it from a position of disadvantage when you, when you, just, you know, move into the ancillary phase of, of the film. So in many respects, financially, the theatrical doesn't make a lot of financial sense. It only kind of makes financial sense as a marketing campaign for the ancillary um, uh, releases. Um, yeah, look, I mean, you know, I, I think it's just a reality that um, that uh, filmmakers uh, have got to confront. Um, you know, uh, there's many ways to quantify the success of a film. Um, very few films get the three and a half thousand screen US uh, rollout. Um, simply because in order to make that happen, you need to spend tens of millions of dollars minimum, uh, you know, just to roll something like that out. You know, so in order to spend, you know, $50 million on a theatrical rollout across America, you know, someone's got to take a punt that like a hell of a lot of people are going to want to go see this film. Now, the taste of the audience um, are being very much assaulted, I think, by um, the sort of these kind of like big brand movies coming in, like these sort of, in, you know, the studios are making less films than they ever have, but they're just spending more money on each one of them. And they're, of course, all these very enormous top heavy sorts of like star vehicles and franchises and these sorts of things. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately that has the effect of, of influencing the tastes of the audience, you know, to the point where audiences actually become less able to cope with more interesting, challenging stuff. And they, and they see the, the theatrical experience in a very limited way, which is the, the kind of, you know, um, you know um, franchise sort of experience. So, you know, all this considered, um, you, you often, you know, find that you will actually reach the audience that your film, you know, is, is going to get a response from if you bypass that whole chain of, um, you know, enormously expensive theatrical distribution.